Herzl is dead. He worked for his people as no man ever worked for them since Judas Maccabeus. His people called him dreamer and demagogue, and towards the end, men of his own party called him traitor and broke his heart. He worked for his people. They paid him his wages, and he has gone home. Israel Zangwill, 1905 On the 27th of July, 1905, the Seventh Zionist Congress convened in Basel. This was the first Zionist Congress since the death of the movement's ostensible leader, Theodor Herzl, as well as the first since the outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War that had so thoroughly upended the status quo in the Jewish world. Herzl's leadership over the Zionist movement had largely been a courtesy. Despite his skills as an organizer, Herzl's Eurocentrism, mercenary tactics, and vision for a politically independent Jewish state at the expense of a revitalized Jewish cultural homeland had antagonized most of the movement. After years of tension, his death and the accompanying failure of his so-called Uganda scheme had finally shifted the balance of power within the Congress. Political Zionism was dead. The Zionist movement would continue its commitment to a homeland in Palestine that would serve as the cultural axis of the Jewish world, but the establishment of an independent Jewish country was no longer a relevant concern. One of the Congress's first acts was to appoint David Wolfson as its new chief executive. This was an easy choice. Wolfson had been part of the movement even before Herzl had, and had served as Herzl's closest confidant, traveling companion, and ultimately the legal guardian of his children. But Wolfson's appointment raised uncomfortable questions. Was he really in charge? Was the Zionist organization even still leading the Zionist movement? The answer was no. The events of 1904 and 1905 had changed the balance of power far more drastically than anyone yet knew. Out of the chaos of war and revolution, a new generation of Zionist leaders was emerging, determined to seize control of the movement and lead it directly from Palestine itself. The first Aliyah was over. The second had just begun. Since its inception in the early 1880s, most Zionists had also been socialists. Even back in 1862, the father of social democracy himself, Moses Hess, had published the proto-Zionist manifesto Rome and Jerusalem in which he predicted that runaway nationalism in Germany would destroy Jewish society in Europe, leading to the establishment of a socialist Jewish commonwealth in Palestine. And in 1898, Nachman Sirkin had authored The Jewish Question in the Socialist State as a challenge to the arch-liberalism of self-appointed Zionist leader Theodor Herzl. But Herzl's dominance over the Zionist Congress ensured that the socialists' influence there would always be limited. As a result, Labor Zionism's first true leader ended up being a complete outsider. During the 1890s, another Jewish political movement had risen to prominence alongside Zionism, Bundism, an ideology originating in Lithuania which combined socialism with Jewish emancipation and more importantly, Jewish autonomism. In theory, this movement wasn't in conflict with Zionism. But as both movements began to gain strength in the final years of the 19th century, Bundist philosopher Vladimir Medem had come to view Zionism as an existential threat to the Bundist cause, since every Jewish socialist who moved to Palestine was one less supporter in the Russian Empire. In 1901, Medem expelled the Zionist faction of the Bund, who quickly coalesced around a 19-year-old Marxist theoretician named Ber Borochov to form the Jewish Social Democratic Labor Party or Poale Tzion. Borochov and Poale Tzion were never able to reach the same level of popularity as the Bund, itself a fairly marginal force in Russian Jewish politics at the time, but it did enjoy a far greater international reach after 1905, when Borochov rallied the socialist faction at the Seventh Zionist Congress, emigrated to the United States, and published his twin manifestos, The National Question and the Class Struggle, and Our Platform. Borochov's theory of labor Zionism can be split into two parts. First, he argued that disproportionate Jewish success in urbanized and industrialized societies was merely the remnant of earlier feudal societies which tied wealth and privilege to land rather than labor and capital. 
Borokhov argued that, as the Western world became more centered around cities and industry, nation states would have a natural incentive to begin systematically excluding both the Jewish proletariat and the Jewish bourgeoisie from their traditional societal niches. This exact scenario had already played out in Romania, where the liberal revolutionary government had curtailed the political and economic rights of Jews while expanding them for everyone else. Building on the ideas of Moses Hess four decades earlier, Borokhov concluded that not only would these historical forces compel the Jewish people to return to Palestine en masse, but that in so doing, the Jewish proletariat could serve as the vanguards of a new Palestinian class consciousness. Now, you'll notice I said that Borokhov moved to the US, not to Palestine, and this was actually true of many leading Zionists of the 1900s. So what gives? For most people, it was simply a quality of life issue. Palestine had no electricity, no running water, no sewers. Disease was rampant. There was banditry, widespread unemployment and poverty, legal discrimination by the Ottoman authorities. And speaking of which, it can't be overlooked that the Ottoman Empire at this time was going through a long-term political meltdown very similar to what was happening in Russia. This disillusionment with the harsh reality of Aliyah was well illustrated in the works of novelist Yosef Chaim Brenner, an associate of Borokhov and one of the most ambivalent figures in the Zionist movement. But for Borokhov, there was also a political calculus. By 1905, the United States had become home to the second largest Jewish population in the world. New York City alone had a larger Jewish population than all but four countries. The U.S. was also unimaginably wealthy, having surpassed Britain as the world's largest economy in the 1890s. Even the poorest Jewish families in the U.S. enjoyed a higher standard of living than they would anywhere else except maybe Australia, where GDP per capita was slightly higher. So to Borokhov, the opportunities for networking, recruitment, and fundraising were obvious. Paul Etzion already had branches in New York and Philadelphia, and with Borokhov's arrival, they were able to organize all over North America. In the years to come, Borokhov would discover one especially promising disciple in the form of a teenage runaway from Milwaukee named Golda Mabovich. So Borokhov's instinct to move to the U.S. wasn't wrong. But at the very same time, someone was establishing himself in Palestine who would prove even more powerful than Herzl had ever been, and far more lasting. David Yosef Green was born in Ponsk in 1886 to a family of poor farmers who'd never made it past elementary school. Though out of embarrassment, he would insist for the rest of his life that his father and grandfather had been lawyers. Despite his family's modest station, his father was quite progressive and encouraged David Yosef to take an interest in Zionism from a young age. At 14, he created what appears to have been the very first Zionist youth movement, Ezra, and began an intense journaling habit that would last for the rest of his life. At the same time, Green began to show some troubling personal qualities that would also characterize his life and career. I've spoken before about the concept of chosenness and how it represents a contract of mutual responsibilities between God and the Jewish people. But Green took it much more personally, writing upon the death of Theodor Herzl that God had chosen him personally to take Herzl's place. This was a sign of things to come. Though Green would later brag that he had never experienced any anti-Semitism in Ponsk, he certainly wasn't indifferent to it. Following the Kishinev pogrom, he merged Ezra into the Warsaw chapter of Poelezion and participated in the party's organized self-defense against the widespread pogroms led by the Black Hundreds in the wake of Russia's 1905 revolution. But despite these accomplishments, Green wasn't really a Borokhovist. He was a socialist, but he rejected Borokhov's notion that Zionism was an inevitable historical force, instead embracing Herzl's dictum, if you will it, it is no dream. This kept him at arm's length from the leadership of Poelezion in Warsaw, and as a high school dropout with no job, whose friends had already left for Palestine, he felt it was time to make the move himself. Arriving in the small town of Petach Tikva in June 1906, Green had intended to join up with his childhood friend Shlomo Tzemach, who for the last couple years had been helping to establish a non-Marxist alternative to Poelezion. 
But while Paul Etzion Warsaw didn't want anything to do with Green, Paul Etzion Palestine weren't about to let their rivals snatch up another rising star. So no sooner had Green found a place to live than Yisrael Shochat, de facto leader of Paul Etzion in Palestine, grabbed him to serve as his ally at the party's very first conference in Jaffa. From the moment of its establishment, the Palestinian chapter of Poel Etzion was bitterly divided between people like Green and Shochat, who were Zionist first, socialist second, and Marxist not at all, and the Rostovians, a contingent of about 30 Russified useful Jews from the city of Rostov who were Marxist primarily and who embraced Zionism only as a means of advancing class struggle. At the conference, the Rostovians forcefully rejected the adoption of Hebrew, which they viewed as a bourgeois language, and demanded that the party and any future trade unions should incorporate Jewish and Arab workers at all levels. Green and Shochat, meanwhile, insisted that the party and future trade unions should be Jewish only, and that Hebrew must be promoted as the official language. Borochov, a devoted scholar of Yiddish who had yet to visit Palestine himself, had always been conspicuously silent on issues of language or Jewish cooperation, which made this kind of division inevitable. But with Green on his side, Shochat was able to overpower the Rostovians. The ensuing Ramla platform, named for the city where it was drafted, thereby finally outlined Paul Etzion's political identity as a party exclusively of the Jewish proletariat, dedicated to the eventual creation of a Jewish socialist republic in Palestine. If Shochat had thought that Green would only serve as a loyal foot soldier, he was gravely mistaken. But Green's megalomania wouldn't go unchecked. He was about to meet his greatest friend and his greatest rival. In April 1907, 23-year-old Isaac Shimshelovich landed in Jaffa. He was a Zionist, but it was desperation rather than idealism that had brought him there. In the year and a half since Borochov's departure to America, Shimshelovich had taken his place as Paul Etzion's spokesman in Russia. He wasn't officially the leader, but he might as well have been, massively expanding the party's reach through a new newspaper and a publishing company. But faced with increased police surveillance following Emperor Nikolai II's coup against the Duma, Shimshelovich was compelled to flee Russia in the dead of night. Careful to not reveal his true identity, he checked into a nearby hotel under a Hebrew name that he would ironically carry for the rest of his life, Yitzchak Ben Svi. Ben Svi's first months in Jaffa were incredibly modest, initially living in an unventilated attic, quite possibly the same unventilated attic where I lived when I started this channel. Soon after, he was taken in by a family of Samaritans, the sister nation to the Jewish people which imbued him with a lifelong fascination with the non-Jewish peoples of Palestine. In the years to come, it was Ben Svi who had first hypothesized that the Palestinian peasantry known as the Felachin were not primarily descended from medieval Arab invaders, as was commonly assumed at the time, but rather were the descendants of Jews who had converted to Christianity and Islam, a hypothesis that DNA testing has largely confirmed. In addition to his cultural views, Ben Svi's humble personality, tall stature, and natural charisma made him just about the perfect foil to the short, loud, and belligerent Green. So when Shochat heard that the former Shimshelovich was in Jaffa, he immediately brought him into the leadership of Paul Etzion to act as a counterbalance against Green. From day one, Ben Svi worked to restore Jewish-Arab solidarity to the party platform. The party then elected Ben Svi and Shochat, not Green, to represent Paul Etzion at the 8th Zionist Congress and the 7th Congress of the Socialist International. While they spent the summer partying in Europe, Green caught malaria for the second time in as many years and his girlfriend broke up with him. And upon their return, Shochat and Ben Svi went behind Green's back to establish the party's new paramilitary force, Bargyora. Finally fed up, Green left Jaffa and joined his friend Samach in the Galilean village of Sejera where he finally adopted a Hebrew name, Ben-Gurion, inspired by Yosef Ben-Gurion, dictator of the short-lived Judean Republic during the First Jewish-Roman War. Now, Tzemach had arrived in Palestine before Ben-Gurion, and during all the drama at Paul Etzion, he'd been up north building up his own political party. Originally created as a non-Marxist alternative to Paul Etzion, 
Apoel Hatzair had continued to distinguish themselves in just about every conceivable way. While Poel Etzion was bitterly divided over language, Apoel Hatzair was resolutely Hebraist. While Ben Gurion had committed Poel Etzion to the establishment of a Jewish state, Apoel Hatzair was happily indifferent to national independence. And while Poel Etzion continued to fight over the inclusion of Arab workers in the movement, Apoel Hatzair actively sought them out. Age played an important part in this. All of Poel Etzion's members were people who'd been born in the 1880s and 90s, after the start of the Zionist movement. In contrast, Hapoel Hatzair's leader Aharon David Gordon was very much a man of an earlier generation. By the time he'd made Aliyah, he was 48 years old, and if not for his wife's insistence, he'd have opted for a far more comfortable life in the United States. But having come to Palestine, his age, his connection to the earliest days of the movement, and his philosophical commitment to leading by example inspired his much younger peers to essentially build a political party around him based in Sajera. Ironically, at the same time Ben-Gurion was arriving in Sajera to teach Hebrew, Shochat and some other Poeletzion people were also invited to help manage the village on behalf of its owner, Baron de Rothschild. There, Shochat met and married his co-manager Manya Vilbushevich, and together with both political parties, they began to experiment with a radical new way of organizing a community. While agricultural settlements had always been a staple of the Zionist movement, they'd always been economically liberalized and disorganized, characterized by an over-reliance on foreign capital and Arab labor. Ahad Ha'am had famously made a name for himself by pointing out these problems, but his solutions remained firmly in the world of classical liberalism. Socialists, like Kishinev's survivor and future politician Yosef Baratz, argued that the failures of the first Aliyah could be rectified by doing away with conventional notions of private land and labor entirely. The practical vision for such a way of life first emerged not in Palestine, but in Japan. During the Russo-Japanese War, Yosef Trumpeldor and his fellow POWs at Hamadera had come up with a new type of settlement that they believed would reconcile the back-to-the-land agrarian vision of cultural Zionism with the fundamentally urban and industrial nature of socialism. These were to be compact strategic hamlets which engaged in both agriculture and industry, where all assets were shared and all decisions were made collectively. While Trumpeldor himself had yet to arrive in Palestine, the Shochats wasted no time putting some of his ideas into action, first by consolidating the village's finances so that everyone effectively shared a single bank account, and then by expanding the paramilitary Bar into the much larger Hashomer. Not everyone in Sajera was part of the collective, certainly not Ben-Gurion, but it was a big hit, and by 1909 there was sufficient capital to build a fully collectivized settlement from scratch on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Deganya Aleph, the first kibbutz. Now, normally when more radical socialists talk about eliminating private property, they're usually just talking about big things like corporations or real estate. The early kibbutz movement was another story. Even personal items could be subject to controversy, and famously, the children of kibbutzniks were raised communally rather than by their parents all the way until the late 1980s, Incredibly, when Yosef Trumpeldor finally made Aliyah in 1912, he didn't think the kibbutz movement had gone far enough. While completing his studies in St. Petersburg, he'd been radicalized from a run-of-the-mill socialist to an anarcho-communist. Also a vegan. Outraged at the lack of ambition he found at Deganya, he almost immediately left with a handful of followers, mostly young women, to found his own kibbutz, Kutzat Migdal. In truth, Nobody in Palestine was surprised by Trumpeldor's behavior. During the Russo-Japanese War, he'd worked hard to promote an image of himself as a calm, unshakable warrior poet. But in the years since, as his politics had become more radical, so too had he revealed himself as a controlling, egotistical bully who had completely lost the ability to live as a civilian. Most of the Yishuv had in fact dreaded his arrival, and his exploits at Kvutzat Migdal did nothing to calm their fears scaring away his girlfriend Bela Kovner and driving one of his workers to suicide. After just eight months, the entire kibbutz mutinied. Trumpeldor, utterly humiliated, abandoned the kibbutz movement entirely, instead settling in Jaffa, 
refocusing his efforts on international advocacy and sleeping with lots and lots of idealistic young women. Now, so far I've only been talking about socialist groups, and to be fair, they did constitute the largest faction of the Zionist movement. But there were two other main factions who quickly followed the socialist lead by establishing themselves in Palestine. Rabbi Yitzchak Yaakov Renez, founder of the religious Zionist movement, never made Aliyah himself. But in 1904, the religious Jewish community of Jaffa invited one of Renez's greatest admirers, Avraham Yitzchak Kuk, to make Aliyah and serve as their chief rabbi. This was religious Zionism's homecoming, and in 1913, Kuk's disciple Yehuda Leib Maimon arrived to form the Religious Center Party, or Mizrahi. You might notice that thus far Jaffa, rather than Jerusalem or even Haifa, had unquestionably become the political epicenter of the Yishuv, and that was having some interesting consequences. Remember in my Kishinev video when I said this? Not even Herzl's invocations of Kishinev could move the Congress to his side. In fact, it was the delegates from the Russian Empire that most adamantly opposed the Uganda scheme, including the delegates from Kishinev. Well, the delegate from Kishinev who'd led the backlash against Herzl was a chemical engineer named Meir Dizengoff, who in 1905 arrived in Jaffa as leader of the liberal general Zionists. Being more wealthy and educated than the leftist or religious factions, the general Zionists were way less tolerant of living conditions in Palestine particularly in the cities, which lacked any modern infrastructure. Echoing the criticisms of Brenner, it seemed to people like Dizengoff that they had simply traded the European ghetto for a West Asian one. And while groups like Hapoel Hatzair saw rural life as a solution to urban conditions, Dizengoff and the general Zionists recognized that if their movement was to succeed, it would inevitably be dominated by cities and industry, just as everywhere else. Back in Europe, some of Dizengoff's allies were rallying support for a radical new idea, a planned Jewish city. Obviously, this wasn't exactly a new idea. The early agricultural colonies of the first Aliyah were fast becoming cities in their own right. And in 1906, a consortium of Zionist activists from North Africa had established Oel Moshe, an independent Jewish suburb of Jaffa. But what was being proposed here was something far more ambitious. Where other nations built planned political capitals, this would be a planned cultural capital. A haven for artists full of pubs and coffee houses, with wide boulevards and grand eclectic architecture inspired by the emerging Garden City movement. If that wasn't ambitious enough, because the chosen site was just outside of Jaffa, it was also subject to Ottoman laws banning Jewish residents from buying public land in the Mutasarifat of Jerusalem. But for some strange reason, the Ottomans never banned the purchase of public land by Jewish non-residents. So the land was purchased by a Dutch delegate to the Zionist Congress and then given out to 60 prospective residents via lottery. On the 11th of April 1909, the 60 families gathered to draw lots on the sand dunes that would soon become their new city. And it needs a name. How are we going to come up with a name? Well, Dizengoff's colleague Menachem Schenken had an idea. Back when Theodor Herzl had published his utopian novel Alt Neuland in 1902, literary scholar Nachum Sokolov translated it into Hebrew for the benefit of a wider audience, which is ironic because Herzl himself was adamantly opposed to the revival of Hebrew. The name Sokolov gave to his translation was Tel Aviv. A tel is an elevated mound created by centuries of human habitation, marking the site of an ancient city. So Tel Aviv, the Tel of Spring, was chosen by Sokolov as a non-literal translation of Alt Neuland that would convey the same idea of a modern society built on ancient foundations. When the founders of this city began looking for a permanent name, Schenken argued in support of Tel Aviv not only as a tribute to Herzl, but as a more naturalistic alternative to other proposals like New Jaffa or Herzliya. It really is the perfect name for what is, to my knowledge, the only city in the world purpose-built as a cultural capital. Now, at the same time all of this had been going on in Palestine, the Ottoman Empire was having a revolution. In the summer of 1908, the constitutionalist Young Turk movement rose up to abolish absolute rule by Sultan Abdul Hamid. Elections were held for a new parliament which included no fewer than four Jewish members. 
But following an attempted counter-coup by the Sultan, the ruling Committee of Union and Progress forced him to abdicate, whereafter they essentially gave up on the constitutional experiment and established an authoritarian police state. Again, very similar to what was happening in Russia, but that wasn't how Poelitzion saw it. With the ruling CUP intent on Ottomanizing the empire through a program of nationalism and militarism, Paul Etzion's leadership concluded that Turkish domination of West Asia would only strengthen in the years to come, and that the Zionist movement would have to become aligned with the new government if it was to survive. So in 1911, Ben-Gurion, Ben-Svi, and the Shochats moved to Constantinople to study law at Istanbul University. By the summer of 1914, they were only a year from completing their degrees when... In June of 1914, the heir apparent to the Austrian crown was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in Bosnia. In retaliation, Austria invaded. This triggered a declaration of war by Serbia's ally Russia, but Austria was given an assurance of military support from the German Empire. The subsequent German declaration of war against Russia triggered a somewhat unenthusiastic alliance between Russia and France, leading Germany to attempt to invade France through Belgium, which then brought Belgium's ally Britain into the conflict. This was it. A hundred years after Napoleon, World War had finally returned. Though the Ottoman Empire officially remained neutral at the outset of war, the three pashas at the head of the ruling dictatorship had made no secret of their love for Imperial Germany and just four days into the conflict signed a secret treaty promising to enter the war as a German ally. On the 1st of October, the three pashas abolished all foreign concessions in the empire, declared martial law in Palestine, and banned the use of Hebrew. Ben-Gurion attempted to spin these developments positively, but it was quickly becoming clear that the Ottoman government wasn't sympathetic to the Zionist movement and never would be. Navy Minister Ahmed Jamal Pasha was particularly well known for his Turkish supremacist views and fanatical anti-Semitism, and it was clear to most that many of the new regulations were coming from his desk. Finally, on the 29th of October, disguised German ships attacked their Russian counterparts while docked in Constantinople, and the Ottoman Empire declared war. While the Ottoman government had given amnesty to all Jews living in Palestine in 1901, Almost everyone who had made Aliyah since remained a foreign national, and from the moment Constantinople entered the war, over 50,000 Olim who had arrived from the Russian Empire were instantly reclassified as enemy aliens. Now, these Russian nationals weren't totally helpless. For a time, Ambassador Henry Morgenthau Sr. from the neutral U.S. was able to convince the port to suspend orders to detain and deport Russian Jews in order to give them time to apply for Ottoman citizenship. Unfortunately, as such applications were extremely expensive and Arab officials opposed to Ottomanization were deliberately slow in processing them, fewer than 100 Jews in the Yishuv had been able to obtain citizenship by the end of the year. Despite these setbacks, Ben-Gurion and Ben-Svi remained insistent that it was in their interest to support the Ottoman position. In a series of articles for Paul Etzion's newspaper Ha'achdut, Ben Svi pointed out that the Ottomans' main enemy in the war was Russia, the great villain of the contemporary Jewish world. If Russia was victorious against the Ottomans, who's to say they wouldn't colonize Palestine and turn it into a new pale of settlement? Ben Gurion added that, if not the Russians, an Ottoman defeat would almost certainly place Palestine under Arab rule, which he believed would be far more hostile to the Yeshuv than the current administration. And as the war effort began hampering their political activity, Ben-Gurion, Ben-Svi, and Trumpeldor even began recruiting volunteers for a Jewish militia that they hoped would become an integral part of the Ottoman army. But any such hopes were quickly and enthusiastically crushed. That November, Ahmed Jamal Pasha was placed in command of the 4th Army in Palestine, whereafter he immediately had the entire Jewish population searched, disarmed, and placed under financial sanction. He then ordered a mass conscription of the Jewish population to serve as forced labor and relinquish whatever hard currency remained in their pockets. Finally, on the 17th of December, Jamal Pasha ordered that any Jew who had not obtained Ottoman citizenship already would be arrested and deported. Military police stormed through the streets of Jerusalem, Haifa, and Tel Aviv, 
grabbing children away from their parents, husbands from their wives, and jailing those they found until they could either be transferred to British-occupied Egypt or sent to internment camps in Anatolia. Many, like Josef Trumpeldor, chose not to wait, instead voluntarily fleeing to Alexandria on the neutral U.S. warship Tennessee. Altogether, Jamal Pasha was responsible for the expulsion of 20,000 Jews, nearly a quarter of Palestine's Jewish population. With each new development, Ben-Gurion and ben Svi's position became more and more untenable. The pro-Ottoman militia they'd attempted to create was forcibly disbanded. Their newspaper Haqtut was shut down by government censors. In spite of all of this, the two men continued to support Ottomanization. But what remained of the Yeshuv wasn't interested. And neither was Jamal Pasha. In February 1915, he denounced Paul Etzion as an anti-Turkish organization, arrested Ben-Gurion and ben Svi on suspicions of treason, and ordered their deportation to Egypt. Before executing the order, he allowed the two men to speak to him face to face, but he rebuffed their appeals, mocking them for even thinking they could reason with him, and vowed that they would never live to return to the Ottoman Empire. Ben Svi would later remark that they were lucky to leave the meeting alive. They arrived in Alexandria in late March. Incredibly, they remained intent on rallying Jewish support for the Ottomans, and in April they would leave Egypt in a doomed attempt to recruit American Jews to the Ottoman cause. But Yosef Trumpeldor had other ideas. In Alexandria, he had completely regained his sense of purpose. He was no friend of Russia, but he believed that as long as the Jewish people yearned for democracy, they had to look to Russia's allies, Britain and France, as their new champions. The Ottoman and German empires would never see Zionism as anything but an enemy. And if Trumpeldor was to return to Palestine, it would not be as a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, but an officer of the British Empire. The second Aliyah was over. There would be a third. Special thanks to my patrons, including Matthew Von Abo, Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskind, Boris Cherney, F.C., Jay Fleischman, Osha Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Jacob Kossoff, and Eric Liederman.